let's start with our first speaker, which uh, some of you probably uh, will know, since she's based here in Utrecht uh, since last year. And uh, she's um, teaching uh, at the University of the Arts here in Utrecht as a senior uh, lecturer in uh, interaction design and games. And um, she creates uh, physical games and user experiences. And uh, Phoenix, you had a pretty busy month. Like in the last month or so, you've been to Belgrade for Resonate, then in Berlin for Amaze and uh, Quo Vadis. Then uh, you went back to New York for F Facet, Facet, which you also organized. Did it go well? Was it good? It was, sold was sold out. You also organized an event in New York, and then you came back, and now you're here. Yes. Are you going to take some rest afterwards? Or? Yeah, I'm going to take some rest, but I fly back. You fly back to the US. Oh, God. OK. Good luck. I don't know how you do it, but well done. So yes, uh, let's welcome on stage uh, Phoenix Perry. For me. Hi, everybody. I'm Phoenix Perry. Um, and I want to start my talk by saying a few things that I think are really important that every speaker says. Um, first of all, anyone in this room, yeah, this is why I wanted the headset mic. All right. So, any in, that's probably too loud. Is that good? Bueller. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> those who got it, high five. All right, so um, anyone in this room who's interested in doing what I can do, you can absolutely end up here. Um, I didn't do anything really particularly special to be here. I just continued doing what I loved for years, and eventually other people began to believe it was relevant. So if you have a passion that you're into and you have something you really care about, I'm going to recommend now that you never give up on that idea and that even when you're poor and it's like it seems like there's nowhere to go forward, I absolutely want to encourage you to continue to invest in your dreams. Okay, next up. All right, so I own a game studio called Dozen Eyes Games. Um, we have been working on a title in our spare time for the last two and a half years called Crystalon, which is getting ever so slowly closer to being released for PlayStation Vita. And it's a match three puzzle game. We also take on a lot of work to feed, feed ourselves. Um, I just released a game with my partner, uh, Ben Johnson, and it's called Choosing My Way. And we made it in conjunction with the United States State Department to help political refugees adjust to life in the United States. We also have a client called the New York Historical Society, and we build many, many, way too many interactives for them. Um, my most exciting project this year with them is I'm remaking Tennis for Two, which some of you may know as the predecessor for Pong, um, which I think is awesome. It makes me crack up for making this like awesome. I got to go to Brookhaven and see it, which was very exciting. But um, we're remaking it in Unity with a 4,000 pixel display. <laughs> it was originally on an oscilloscope and like yay big. It's pretty hilarious. So anyway, I also run an organization that has been incredibly successful in the New York City area called Code Liberation Foundation. We've taught now over well over 1,000 women to program between the ages of 6 and 16. We have a high school program, which has been doing fairly well. And we made inclusivity a mandate um, in our organization. So when I originally founded it, I looked for women who maybe didn't know how to program very well and showed interest or were from interesting backgrounds. And together, we founded an organization that I'm pretty positive at this point has radically helped reshape the games community in New York. Um, this is an organization that I have a tremendous passion for. And as a mentor, I've done my best to not actually run it, <laughs> which might sound funny, but it's really important if you're a leader in the field to allow others to step up and take that role who are, who are younger and maybe a little less experienced because they will rise to the occasion. This is an organization that I want to see here in Holland, um, and I'm looking for young women who are interested. Uh, Dot showed up to the one event I did try and run. We had six people there, seven, <laughs> it made me very sad, but we need more, we need more ladies. Um, so this is a class I ran for physical games at NYC Resistor, which is a hacker space I'm a friend of, and it created the MakerBot and many other um, things that have gone on to shape the Maker Revolution. 
Uh, I made a one button game with a group of women. We also ran a game jam called Bossed Up, which is one of my favorite uh, game jams we've ever run. Nina Freeman led that up. And Nicki Minaj um, was our inspiration. She's, uh, there's a YouTube video of her getting really angry about being called a bitch for taking control in a situation. And she talks about how when Lil Wayne does it, he's bossed up, but when she did it, she was a bitch. And I think that that was a really important thing. And we chose that because it gave young women a chance to make a game about empowerment. This is just a shot of our high school classes. Uh, we run three to four lady jams every year. We've worked with organizations like Black Girls Code, and every time we manage to teach about 50 or 60 young African-American women um, how to program, which is really exciting. Um, we have a lot of games that have come out of the Code Liberation Foundation, and I wanna show you some of those now. Uh, the most uh, like celebrated at this point is Nina Freeman's How Do You Do It, which is a game about two Barbie dolls having sex, which is kind of awesome. Uh, <laughs> This is uh, The Five Stages, which is a video game poem about a breakup. This is Slam City Oracles by Jane Friedhoff, which is yet to be released, but is fantastic. This is Stellar Smooch, which is my personal favorite. You can get it free on iOS, and I'm not gonna tell you anything else because you should go play it. Okay, so I'm gonna give a bit of a quick rundown on how I think we can engage women in programming in three steps. One, we need to admit defeat and empower change. When you see the fact that you're in a programming class and there's like two women in the room, you need to do everything in your power to enable that woman to succeed. Women majoring in computer science fell in U.S. universities between 70, uh, fell in U.S. universities 79 percent between 2000 and 2011. Um, I'm considerably sure it's worse in Holland because I have yet to meet in person, another female game developer in the year I have lived in this country. I think we need to start recognizing bias. And I think we need to start recognizing that CS courses cater to male interests. They focus on how computers and code work and how to take that apart. And I think we need to really reintroduce code as a way to create. Which one of these two classes would you rather take? A computer science 101 in C++ class or creative approaches to problem solving in science and engineering using Python, I think I'd rather be in B. Like, the word creative in there makes me 10 times more interested, right? So I think it's time that we declare death to the programmer. This needs to go. <laughs> There's no reason for this. There's no reason that we need to do code push-ups and, and talk about how hard programming is. Because what happens is when young women come into the field, they're driven away. And we need to recognize that that's happening, and we need to leave no coder behind. So I think it's time that we integrate the creative and the technical, and we present computation as an introduction to the creative arts and to problem solving. And this is why I believe that. I believe programming is a political act, and I believe we're at the naissance and at the very beginning of what programming is going to become in the next 200 years, 300 years, 1,000 years. And these ideas that are getting born right now and getting adopted are fundamentally important to the future of humanity. The structure they take will be built upon and it will become the bedrock going forward. If you doubt what I'm saying, all you have to do is look at the Unix programming language and how it's now running the backbone of the internet. Um, and I don't think that was ever what it was designed for or meant for. But once one of these things becomes adopted, additional technologies get built upon it, and so on and so on and so forth, all of a sudden you have the fact that functional programming is actually part of now how I think we think about code computationally. So in my opinion, programming and code can be open, and ideas should benefit us all. I kind of am the Nikola Tesla of programming, and that I believe that programming, when it's just for the few or the elite, is a useless endeavor. You should see the difference in the ideas created by Rattle Perlman and her tree structure behind the internet and in Donna Bailey's centipede controller. For those of you who don't know, without Rattle Perlman, you wouldn't have the internet. She developed the non-hierarchical distributed network that you use to connect to servers. So now I'm gonna switch focus and talk a little bit about my research. Um, so I believe in, in, oh, this is the uncorrected version of my slides. High five, this will be fun. <laughs> so, um, oh, that means this is my amaze talk, not my resonate one. That's fine. So I believe in experience, embodiment, and ecology. 
and I call those the three E's. And I'm going to talk a little bit how I got here and how I ended up on this journey. So I started with the same experience all of you did. Um, I started with having a love for video games as a child and seeing them as something that gave me a voice and a way to like contribute to the world. And I wanted to be a video game designer because that's awesome. It was either that or astronaut. Astronaut was out of the picture when my vision went. So, well, now I'm here. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is the very first uh, machine I programmed on. <laughs> This is the VT100. Um, this is a command line Unix driven networked um, hub. In some ways, I think we'll go back to this and your computer will become less and less about storing files on your own machine and maybe storing them in the network, like where we started. I don't know, just a thought. <laughs> so to me, I believe in this as an anachronistic interface, as I've decided to call it. And the reason I believe that is keyboards like this with really horrible human computer interaction factors allowed me to really destroy my body. And I ended up with a case of what can only be called crippling carpal tunnel. Um, in 1998 and 9 and 2000, I was a developer in Silicon Valley. Um, and I was one of the original dot-com people. And I really did think, okay, this is it. I'm about to get wildly wealthy. I need to do nothing. I just need to cash out these next couple of years. And I ate junk food. I slept under my desk and developed a whole host of terrible user inter interface practices. And what that let me do is forget and destroy my body. Um, and at some point, I had to be faced with the fact that I could no longer brush my teeth, I could no longer comb my hair, um, my boyfriend had to take out the trash because I could no longer lift the bag, and I started having to spend 15 hours a week in physical therapy. Um, over the period of four years, I probably spent hundreds of hours rebuilding my body. And all of this because the interface I had originally used was modeled on a typewriter. So why do we do that? Why do we bolt a typewriter onto a nonlinear distributed system? And to me, all of a sudden, I was encountering my body as this like alien that I had never, ever encountered before. I was like, oh my god, what's going on here? Because I didn't have control of it. And if you've ever not had control of your body, you begin to realize just how foreign and outside of it you feel. And at that point, I began to experience emotions through my physical therapy that had nothing to do with what was actually going on in my life. And I began to observe that my emotions were actually not triggered by my cognitive self. They were triggered by some other second part of myself, some ghost in the machine. And I began to think of the body as a technological material that I was super unfamiliar with. Um, and for me, the body is the most interesting intersection for tech. And the potential interactions we're overlooking are amazing. And they're probably lurking in our neurobiology cross-modal interactions such as synesthesia and embodied cognition. So I'm going to propose something today that is pretty radical and pretty crazy. Um, in fact, I was really afraid to say it until after I left NYU. And even then when I was back and I said it at Game Center at Facets, I had a mild panic attack. I'm going to propose an anti-formalist approach to games. And that's where everything in the game is adaptive and performative and responds to the user. I'm going to start at the beginning of my journey to create experiences in game environments like this for myself. This is a band I had called Black Swan. And I wanted to create a tech-free music performance environment where my partner and I could just go on stage and the way we played our instruments and the way we moved triggered all the video and all the sound. And I didn't have to worry about having a laptop in front of me, even though we were an electronic band. And what that ended up doing is for me to basically try and implement, and this was before the Kinect came out, some really barbaric tracking algorithms. And by barbaric, I mean has a really hard time with changes of light, with unprecise motion, with things like glass behind you. Um, and they made the tracking for all my motion almost impossible. And in fact, we were asked to perform, I think, I can't remember, it was one of Brandon Boyer's things. And I was so excited, we got up stage and we were behind a glass window and all of a sudden nothing worked. I was like, I gotta get away from this. I can't use tracking tech, it's terrible. So I began to look into machine learning. This is a machine learning environment I built in Unity in 2010. And I combined my software 
with a platform that I'm continuing to work with today called Wekinator. And then we routed all of the information from Unity through Wekinator to Ableton Live, and we managed to create a really seamless performance space for ourselves using the Connect. Um, my partner also worked with Keith McMillan, which is a leading um, hardware producer. You can go buy his stuff almost anywhere. Um, and we produced this thing called a Cabo, which has a accelerometer, a tilt sensor, pressure sensors, just a whole ton of sensors. Because basically what it did is when Meg pros pressed down on her, her bow with a lot of pressure, I could do, let the visuals go from being up front to all of a sudden being a particle explosion in the back, right? Um, and I thought that was really fun. And that led me to really believe that users should never be forced to conform their body to the affordances of an interface. If it hurts you, it's trash. How long can you play a game controller before your hands go? Who here has tried to play Child of Eden with the Kinect? Oh my god, worst experience ever. How long can you hold your arm like this? Like really, like what, five minutes maximum? They should sell a prop with that game, you know? <laughs> Um, so the reason I chose machine learning to kind of explore creating these environments was because of this. So do you guys see gesture one is this, gesture two is this, gesture three is this, but maybe I'm going to go like this and I'm not going to really ever hit my target, right? Um, and what that does is if you've used machine learning, it works just like our neural networks do. So if I give you a whole ton of information and say one is red, two is blue, you might, and I say three, you might come up with purple, right? Because you're gonna try and meld those two together. That's exactly what a neural network does. It just tries to model our own natural way of computing. So it looks a little bit like this. Um, and there's this like, what users kind of think of as a hidden layer that you don't actually see, which is the neural network processing. And so what we did is we gave it a whole series of inputs, like my arms were raised, or Meg was pressing the bow heavily. And what we did is we associated, say, when Meg presses the bow heavily, we want the particle system to explode in the background, and we want um, all the other sound to come down so you can hear her playing. And then we just continued to add those and stack those and stack those. So then when we just played, magic stuff just happened. We didn't even have to try to write music anymore. It was just kind of evolving, and then we began to be able to react and respond to it. So I'm going to talk about some experiences that I think are kind of going in this direction in, in programming and in, in interfaces that get kind of released on the internet. Because all of you guys probably want to actually be able to release things out that you can download off Steam, right? So these are applications that I consider giving the user a tremendous amount of agency. And that's what I want to do. I want to encourage agency. So this is a application called Auto Illustrator. And it is from the 90s. It's the Wayback Machine. That is OSS. OS 7, 8, I don't know. But um, what it did is it had all these computational and natural algorithms built into Illustrator. And it exported vectors you could take out into regular Illustrator. So it gave you this kind of random, natural, organic way of creating that I thought was really lovely. Um, one of my favorite is inspirational, mutilate into. <laughs> What does that even mean? I don't care, but it's really fun, and it gives me something to collaborate with and to react with, versus having to constantly always tell my software what to do, which I think is kind of boring. Maybe some of you have played this. Has anyone here played this? Oh, I recommend downloading it. You have, yay! <laughs> How to become a great artist in just 10 seconds. Um, this basically gives you this very mysterious way to corrupt an image, and it's a whole lot of fun. And it allows for a kind of creativity in response to what the system is doing. You never tell the system, hey, I want this image to break into a thousand pieces and go teal. You just kind of get a sense of what it's trying to do, and there's a lot of play in that, right? And that's what we're supposed to be encouraging, play. Okay, so, so now I'm gonna go back to how I realized my body was creating emotions, and I was using my physical experience to actually work through what those emotions were. So this actually turns out to be a fact in cognitive science. I'm not just making it up. <laughs> in fact, it's something that I embedded into a video game I made. So this is a game I made called Nightmare Kitty, which there's been a strange amount of interest in recently, so I may go back and re-release it and actually distribute it for the Connect 2. 
Um, this game was made before I was part of the early Connect hacker group, and I helped write a book on the Connect. And this was before Microsoft released the open source SDK, so my only option was to use machine learning. There was no other way for me to harangue that data into behaving. There's no other way. <laughs> so um, I used machine learning to basically make this little video game that embedded a bit of cognitive psychology. So back in the late 1800s, um, a psychologist who's one of my favorite crazy lunatics throughout history observed this phenomenon, and his name is William James. And what he came up with was the, the James Longe effect, because two, Carl Longe also developed it at the same time. I probably say his name wrong, forgive me, French people. But anyway, um, what it said is actually we don't go, I should be afraid, and then all of a sudden your heart races and your adrenaline fires and your cortisol spikes. What happens is your body senses that there could be a threat to you. And so you experience the feeling of fear, it spikes your cortisol, it raises your heart rate, it triggers your neurotransmitters, and then you become aware like, oh God, I'm really afraid, I should move. That's actually the order that those things happen in versus the other way around, which is counterintuitive to what you might think about emotion. Turns out this is true for other emotions other than fear. So I decided to work with fear and children, and the reason I did is because I believe that when you're a little kid, you're afraid a lot. <laughs> In fact, when I was little, I remember being afraid about 75 to 85 percent of the time, depending on how dark it was. So I decided to make a very dark video game <laughs> that allowed children to use this idea called power posing. So I wanted to be able to empower them to feel like they had some control or some agency in their environment. So I embodied the interaction in their physical form in the way they had to hold and move their own bodies. So this kind of idea of power posing goes on to be this kind of fact that you can actually um, trigger emotion through your physiology. So I wanted to get to this slide. So this is what these look like. So these are this great study that came out by a couple of professors, uh, Carney, Cuddy, and Yap. Um, and the paper is called Brief Nonverbal Displays of Neuroendocrine Levels and to Risk Tolerance. So it turns out that just by putting your body in these two positions, your, neuro your neurochemical um, self changes. In fact, the bottom one causes your mind and your body to release cortisol, which is really interesting. It raises your stress hormones, and it also causes your heart rate to slightly accelerate. What does that sound like, right? So what I did is I put children, I'm gonna go back to this so you can see it, um, in that position. So they would begin to encounter that, but then I gave them the ability to rapidly stand up by popping the little kitties that landed, and the kids really loved this. Um, in fact, it won two blue ribbons at Maker Faire and had a constant line. And it was my first hint that maybe I was going in the right direction with this stuff. <laughs> so I've been working on a project for the last two years called Night Games, which tries to fuse what I learned from Nightmare Kitty and what I learned from my video game slash band into a one environment. I'm about, I would say, 75% of the way through um, what might be this process. So the first thing I did was use the PlayStation Move, and I um, happened to work in the same lab as Doug Wilson. So I had all these moves just sitting around, and it turns out that they're just full of sensors that Doug was not leveraging, like heat sensors and gyroscopes and accelerometers and lighting, and he's using a few but not all of these. So I thought to myself, well, that's a bunch of cheap hardware, and it's free, and it's here. <laughs> I will just make a game with it. Um, so what I did is I split a series of sounds for a kind of rhythmic track onto these PlayStation moves and gave them to children. And I also had a monster, because children, yay, monsters, right? What I learned from Nightmare Kitty. And I encouraged them to dance around and, and make music together. And I have a video, my favorite video of it actually, is a drum corps showed up and played it much better than children ever did. So I'm gonna show you a little video of that really quick. So 
that's kind of what it looked like. Um, and that made me really, really happy. And I was like, well, I want to keep, uh, and some of my slides are about to be cut off here for a sec, so I apologize. They put me on a much smaller display than I was at, at, at Umaze, So, But that gave me the kind of hint that I could begin to think, begin to think of games as an ecology, right? Maybe as an ecology versus an economy, or rather than a, an economy. And I was really inspired by Proteus, which is, has anyone played Proteus in here? Yeah. There are no rules, you're free to roam around in this environment, and you experience this soundscape. So I wrote David Kanega, and he's now helping on the project slash working uh, with me uh, to work on some of the sounds. Hopefully, eventually, we'll get those in. Um, and I'm trying to build a world that people play within. I was also really inspired by Robin Arnott's Sound Self, which I feel does this in a way, too. And I really like Sound Self actually when it is not on the Oculus and it's installed in a nightclub. Has anyone ever played it in that format? So what he does is he hangs a mic from the ceiling and he projects onto the ceiling and he has everyone lay on their backs and sing in unison. And I think that's just a really beautiful experience that he loses with the rift. So this is what I was saying earlier. I want to think of games as an economy versus games as a or I want to think of games as an ecology versus thinking of them as an economy, and that should be a bit longer. So, All right, so I also want to consider you guys all to think about games as a possibility space where the rules are actually recreated in response to the play, and your job is only to provide props and possible goals. So this uses, how many developers do I have in the room? Okay, I have a good number, so I'm going to go here. This uses unsupervised machine learning. And this is new. I'm actually seeking funding for this project in the EU right now. Um, before, the kind of machine learning I was using was called supervised learning. And that's where you give something a set of inputs and you tell it what the output should be. Machine learning that is unsupervised goes, well, here's a ton of data. Pull out the pictures of cats. <laughs> And it tries to figure that out over and over and over. And you give it feedback on whether or not it's giving you something you want. And to me, that feels a lot more like the creative software I was seeing earlier, right? So I'm interested in allowing vision tracking to watch players or any other kind of analytics. Um, and then generate a list of possible rules I could use to crack the game. And I think that that's a really different way of structuring games. And to me, what this does is it puts the affordance in the world and it allows there to be a ecological approach to play where systems can learn to adapt. And it allows players to evolve the rules of play as their experience unfolds, right? And it creates an empowered, agency-driven environment. And when I realized that this is what I had been doing, I realized that experience plus embodiment plus ecological approach to design can equal player empowerment. And at this point, I began to realize that my feminism and my politics were heavily connected to the kinds of systems I'd been creating in games. All along the way, I had been encouraging people to use expanded systems, because if we limit systems, we train players to think in limited ways. So now I'm going to give you a peek at the second version of Night Games, which is evolving from the PlayStation Move format to build a physical world. So this is a prototype. Um, I made it in literally two days. But it was the first time I tried to get people to play together with a set of sensors, and I rewarded them for playing um, together, I guess would be the way to say that. So let's see, am I going to be able to start this? Let's see. How about that? Yeah. So as they play, the pitch goes up higher, and they can kind of make rhythm together using uh, Hema bike flashlights. It's one oscillator right now. It's standing up, right? so if yeah. three people shine yeah. on the sensors, then they're going to get We built it in two days. <laughs> yeah, literally. But that's a cool thing because it's like you. So that's the, the project I'm, I'm working on now. So. We modeled this world with a rather ambitious notion of what we could build in, a, in an installation. So that's it with lights off, that's it with lights on. Um, and then what I did is I attempted to map 
the sounds to the height of the interaction. So the lower sounds are the ones for the hut. The next higher sounds are actually the human voice. Um, then the tree, then the stars, and I tried to map the interaction to the positioning. So uh, the cool thing with this is the clouds just look like a muted out piece, but the truth is, is I'm analyzing the human voice, and then later I'm generating a higher pitch on top of that. So uh, these were what our clouds looked like in notebook paper form. We, we tried to assemble them like this. It was surprisingly easy and deceptive. <laughs> Then we laser cut them, and it took two days to assemble them at scale. <laughs> so here's, uh, or about a day and a half. So this poor woman, thankfully, whoever she is, sat there folding paper. <laughs> then the hut, we decided to paint sensors onto the inside of the hut so users could use proximity and touch to kind of play and touch them. So I used bear conductive paint, which I highly encourage, if those of you make physical games in this room, to check out the bear board. Stable well-supported, and the documentation doesn't make me angry. However, no forums, which does make me angry, but they promise me they're working on it. So this is kind of what the dome started looking like as we got it all assembled. And then I decided to make a rock because I didn't want to use the PlayStation Move experience entirely. I wanted to go something people they could shake. Um, this is the HKU Ultimaker, which I resurrected from the dead. Um, let me take it home and fix it. Um, and we made this lovely rock. Um, and I decided to make it out of Dago filament, filament, because why would you not? And then I decided to light it from the inside and give a vibration, vibration sensor and accelerometer sensor. So now you can see that we worked also to, when we printed it, we tried to get the, the diamond shape to mirror all the way through the installation. So this is the tree, part one, part two. These are the box we made. We decided to make custom cat enclosures, because why not? Uh, this is my partner, Adele Lynn, um, who I could never have done this without, uh, assembling it with a, I think she's got this, oh God, help us. This woman can boss a power saw. Um, and we showed it a maze, and we assembled it in the real world. So it came together okay. Um, we learned a really powerful lesson, which I want to share with everyone here. If you want to use conductive paint, it's got a little bit of sensitivity to say, oh, humidity. So in the morning, our sensors worked great, but by the evening, not so much, if at all. So uh, I have some tactics now for fixing that, which made me kind of sad. But live and learn, live and learn. Um, so this is uh, kind of what it looked like. You can see the sensors in this one. Um, and that was the whole thing in the daylight which, I, isn't that tent heinous? They didn't tell us they were gonna put us outside the last minute. I was like, ah, it's a terrible, ugly tent. But whatever. So anyway, I am at Phoenix Perry, and you can find me at contact at phoenixperry.com. That be it. <laughs> so now I get to take questions with Lorenzo's help wherever he's at. Bueller, Bueller. Okay, it's just me. <laughs> All right, questions. Does anyone have them? Raise your hand. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And there's a, a lot of games that could be built to explore empathy with virtual reality. Um, I was just a juror at Amaze, and we actually gave an award to a woman using VR to put you in the shoes of a little girl. And we thought that that was wonderful. And uh, I really encourage more experiences like that. I think that uh, A Perfect Woman is also a really good not VR version of that. And the more we can give ourselves every different possible kind of body, the more we'll learn to connect with our fellow human. Next. Oh, come on. Yes. I can tell you which one was had 3% female enrollment and which one had 50% female enrollment. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Yeah, because it tells me that I'll be able to make something. And for women, I think that the ability to create is in just hardwired into us, which is why so many of the original innovations in computer science were done by women. We love building things. We just don't like taking things apart and analyzing them as much, um, particularly when we're younger. And I think the reason you guys have such a bias here in Holland is at 12 years old, they ask you to choose. And that's particularly when women are becoming aware of themselves and particularly when they want to find out who they are and share their story and connect. And that's when guys are still in that kind of a bit younger mindset and I, I think they need to work on that. I think if they'd ask even five or six years later, things would change. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, more women enroll. I mean, it's, it's a subtle thing and bias is subtle and nuanced and deep. And it's one way we can address it, but I think that, you know, gender is codified and performative. Um, I think even that has a lot of flexibility. I think if we started really tapping into gender bias, like at a much younger age and not showing girls Barbies and stuff, they may de develop psychologically different and we may have a completely different kind of answer there. My solution is kind of a hack to an already busted system. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. that got me here or that helps me encourage women to program? Which one of those two do you want? Oh, the code liberation stuff. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that was actually a surprising success with very little, I, I all on intuition. Um, I went through a traditional, I have an engineering um, background. Um, so, I, and I was always um, really cool to be the only lady in the room, that's fine, whatever, I don't care. Who cares? It's not about why I'm here, right? But then um, one day I realized that I had fought really, really hard. And as I had moved forward in my career, I'd watched a lot of men around me get promoted, and none of the women. And I began to realize, oh, Jesus, we have Houston, we have a problem. Um, so what I decided to do, and the reason I did it, was because I got kicked in the teeth so many times um, down to the point where it came down to me and one other person. I also did a lot of design, because I love design. Um, I'm an equally skilled robot, which doesn't happen. Uh, when I switched from development, when my arm was so fucked up, I could still draw. So I was able to uh, use my left hand. <laughs> and it became a heavily award winded, oh, a heavily awarded designer. I have a con award, uh, three webbies. But uh, one of them's from development, the other two are from design. But yeah, my hands were so whacked out that I ended up designing. Anyway, long story short, um, it came down to me and the, uh, I don't even know if I can say this. It came down to me and one other person to lead the creative team from one of my absolute favorite video games. The client, who actually was one layer removed from the game company, chose the man and apologized to me and said, we just feel his creative will connect more with a male audience. This is a game that's got at least 50-50 players, if not skewing towards being more female because it's got a female protagonist. So like when that happens, when you're straight out told it's not your skill, but it's your gender, and that's why you're not getting a job, that's a big problem. And that's a problem we need to deal with. So for me with the Code Liberation Foundation, I was kind of luck. Um, I decided to try and find younger women who I could stop what happened to me from happening to them. So I used all of my connections, all of my industry profile, and all of my skill as an educator to raise them up and basically turn them into really serious developers. They all now work as developers in the field. And then I was able to use them as like a tract mode for younger women and other women because when they saw examples, other people came out also, our classes assume zero knowledge. They're like, hey, are you interested in programming but have no prior knowledge? Does math scare the ever-loving bejesus out of you? Did you have an interest in, in maybe making something? Well, let's just show you how to do that. 
And that actually helped a lot uh, because it took a lot of the fear out of it. So I think that that was a big part of it. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, that's my uh, my thing. Like mhm. Mm yep. Yeah, for sure. Mhm. Mm So my experience is the reason Nightmare Kitty actually had a heart rate monitor, but I had a really hard time getting enough people to let me let them, like, strap it on them. And at some point, just to be able to get players in and out of the game, I removed it. Um, and I find it really good for, like, lab settings, but we still don't have a device that makes it really applicable to, like, wide-scale adoption. So we're, we're just like at the naissance of that. So I'm doing my PhD now at Utrecht University, and I'm doing it in computer science with a focus on tactile and audio feedback for, sorry, for headless interfaces so, and headless games. So that means games without monitors, screens. So it's all the information of the game is fed back through touch and sound. And my hope is to answer some questions that like, at what point are we able to perceive touch data? At what point does that data overwhelm? Because we only have so much neural processing. What is, how long does it take to cognitively remap our neural processing if we play under these conditions? Like, those are all questions that I decided to answer, which is why I'm, I'm pursuing it as a PhD, because it's fascinating. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, anybody else want the mic? Who has a new game out? Lorenzo is back! You're back! <laughs> Can you not find them? Did you find them? You tweeted, is he in the room? Okay, I'm just waiting for you, dude. We have time, we have time, we have 10 minutes. Okay, who has a new game out? No one. Come on, you have a title you want to promote. I know it. I know. It. I have like ten minutes and I have nothing to say. All right, Lorenzo. Okay. All right. Okay. Yep. Oh my God! I would love it so we could open source our template. That's one of my plans this year. Um, do what I did, find women who are younger who maybe don't have the experience, get one person who has good connections and mash them together and make sure each one of those girls is from a radically different environment with over two to 3,000 Twitter followers. That's my advice. <laughs> cool. Yay! <laughs>